Welcome to What's Pastors Podcast. My name is Robert. My name's Damien. And I'm Steve. And I'm James. And today we're joined by a, another special guest, Saren. Hi. Uh, Saren is a member of Hereafter Productions and formerly a member of Anvil Productions. And uh, we'll be talking to her about some of the shows and things she's done in the past. And if you like cl- uh, listening to us talking to our friends and you're watching on YouTube, why not like, comment and subscribe? And don't forget, if you're listening to us on any other platforms, please hit that follow button. So, uh, Sarah, the first thing we usually ask our guests is, uh, how did you get first get started in uh, in acting? What drew you to it? So, um, I was really lucky that a friend introduced me to a local theatre company, and um, I was really wanting to be more confident in myself. I was quite a shy child, really, and. Um, yeah, so I was lucky enough to get involved with a theatre school and uh, yeah, that really brought my confidence on and I found myself just growing in confidence each time I went to different sessions and meeting new people and just getting involved with just different types of theatre and it definitely just made me into the person I am today, I think, really. Was that props? Yes, that, that was props, joined? yes. Yeah, so that's where you met? Um, yes, that's where I met yourself. Myself. And- yep. Yeah. But not Robert. No, he wasn't in props. <laughs> no. I wasn't lucky enough to be involved in that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I missed all the fun. So you you um do, do you remember when when you joined? I joined in the winter of 2016 and I was almost 13 and I was just looking something to do outside of school and I completely fell in love with theatre as soon as I joined there. It really did bring on my confidence and I found something I was passionate about. So, yeah. Was there a particular person that, um, uh, or, or something that uh, particularly uh, in- influenced you to uh, to join um, or to start acting, pantomimes, audio plays, etc.? Um, what? what influenced you and what sparked your interest? Um, well, my family are heavy, heavily involved in the um, in the music business. So uh, my grandmother is involved. Uh, she was involved heavily as a support act for a lot of famous entertainers. So, um, yeah. And cool. she got me just uh, getting, she got me really involved in uh, the theatre side as well. We used to go and see a lot of musicals growing up. And uh, she encouraged me to just give it a go because she knew that I was starting to take an interest in it as I got older. So, uh, yeah. It, um, can you name any of the uh, people that your your uh, grandmother worked with? Um, Ken Dodd. She um, oh. was a support act for cool. Ken Dodd. <laughs> oh, cool. uh, Jimmy Tarbuck, comedian. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Quite a lot of the big names back in the 60s and 70s. Yes. Well. All of uh, Stephen's generation. (laughs) Ah. (laughs) Do you have any particular favourite actors or actresses that also influenced you to follow a bit of acting? So I watched a particular TV show in 2014. Um, It was based on the life of the Liverpudlian singer and TV presenter Cilla Black. Oh, yeah. And... uh, uh, she was played by the brilliant actress Sheridan Smith, and she really inspired me. I really admired yeah. her, and uh, yeah, I'd say she's probably one of the probably one of the actors that got me into theatre. Really, yeah, she she is good. Hmm. She yeah, is, she is. So you joined. So you you were in props, and then presumably Anne asked you to be in uh, an Anvil show. Yes, she did. Uh, I did Robin Hood in 2017 and it probably was the first, I'd say, it was probably a production that I'd say I had the most responsibility with. It was probably like my first big show, really. Um, I'd been involved with the more of the children's side of theatre, so um, I was basically just being introduced to it through games and just amateur shows, but this was probably more on the... Um, on the more mature side, and I'd say that I, I did really enjoy the experience, and I just knew that I wanted to continue it further. So I did, and here I am now. <laughs> and you were kind of, I mean, to be fair, like you were considerably younger than like everyone else in the cast because you were like, what were you, 13 or something? 14? 
I, yeah, nearly 14. Um, yeah, it was, it, it did, I, I'll be honest, it felt quite daunting at first. Um, but uh, yeah, I did, I found friends in you all and yeah, I, I really, I really did enjoy the experience and I'm thankful to have stuck by you all. It's been, it's been brilliant. Uh, throughout Props Theatre School and Anvil, you've grown up as a person from someone who was quite shy to someone who's now quite confident. So can you talk us through your journey? Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a hard question, isn't it? Thanks for putting me on the spot, right, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to write a, a whole essay about that now. <laughs> but before I even reply to it. Oh, wow. And uh, just to forewarn you, the following que- my follow-up question to that would be, what were your thoughts on um, Brexit? <laughs> oh, no. and we want a 5000 page essay by tomorrow thank you oh i can do i can do that it's fine it's fine um i would say really that um from even in the first few months of joining the theater school i just blossomed in confidence and um i wasn't really one for making friends when i was younger and um i struggled a lot with i grew up being quite badly bullied um, in primary school and um, theatre for me just basically gave me an avenue to just express myself and yeah um, it has really helped me and it has definitely helped me grow in confidence and um, yeah so I'm really grateful that it's done that for me. I mean I, I can you know I'd, I'd say actually it's the same for me as well like I was bullied through primary school and I think like theatre you know always gave me kind of uh you know uh, a place that was kind of safe to kind of express myself and 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 stuff um you know i think like people probably assume that um actors or you know, people that do kind of theater and performance are going to be naturally quite um confident kind of people and i've actually found that's often the complete opposite um from the truth a lot of the time like a lot of people i think are drawn to theater because it's a kind of it's a way that you can be someone else in a a very safe and predictable environment because you you learn lines and you perform them and you know exactly what you have to say and you know exactly what everyone else is going to say um, more or less hopefully and, um, <laughs> yeah hopefully <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but but you know it's like um, it's it's a way that you can become someone else and be judged for your portrayal of someone else rather than being judged for who you actually are you know? yeah I, I think that really appeals that really appeals to me I'm sure it yeah. appeals to a lot of other yes. people I, well. I don't want to sound like I'm going too deep here but is this the same with everyone else that uh, you created a character, for example, I've created a character called Damien, who is who I am now, basically, where, throughout school. Like, uh, throughout school, I, yet again, same story, bullied, whatnot. And I was kind of depressed, the only kid in the corner. But after doing drama, I kind of <clears throat> became a better version of me through yes. drama. Is that the yes. same with everyone else? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I'd, I'd almost go as far as to say that, like, we are kind of a, kind of a, in some ways a, a kind of group of misfits. That part of the reason that we're friends is it it it's a kind of weird group of people to be friends. I think, like, the yeah. fact that we're all like people from different backgrounds, different ages, and everything, yep. and uh, it's kind of something that defines how we came together as a group of friends, really. And we, we've got a caveman here anyway. You, you'll recognise a caveman from a previous episode, uh, from episode 12 of the podcast with uh, with ghosts. We're talking about Steve being a caveman. So, yeah, you say different ages. There we are. Yeah. God damn it, Damien. I was trying to say something nice. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, you know, I was uh, at slightly different ages, but then there's Steve just on a different level. Uh, excuse me. Hang <laughs> on a minute. There's not that much of a gap. <laughs> we are but insects in his... <laughs> it's not like, I don't know if you remember the old cartoon called Captain Caveman. It's not like mm. that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> 
I had to stop um, all that uh, soppy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. So I was going to ask, um, of all the shows that you've done with Anvil, Props, Hereafter, and whatnot, um, do you have a particular favourite show that you've done and a favourite character that you've played? Um, I would say for me, I, when I did a show with Anvil in 2000 and... 2017 it was now, gosh. That's, uh, yeah. Was it 2017 or 2018? Wizard of Oz. Oh, Wizard oh. of Arts. Yeah, 2017. 2017. Yeah. Oh, gosh, that's like, ages ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say that show for me, really, uh, not just because I played the lead, but because of who the character was and just yeah. completely stepping out of my comfort zone. She's nothing mm. like how I am and how I've ever been. So, uh, yeah playing someone younger than my age as well and just stepping in into a completely different role and embodying a really childish, really feminine, <laughs> really outrageous character with this bold personality. And yeah, I'd say for me, that was the role that really changed me and my outlook of acting, I'd say, because it was completely different to how I am as a person. <laughs> Can I just say that song that you wrote, The Little Country Home, was so difficult to sing. And the t- amount of time I spent learning that and just like, not just the lyrics, but actual the voice control for that song and just pitching and everything was just, can I just say it was a cracking song, but it was hard to sing. <laughs> I want to add to that though. Back then, your voice was really high, and now your yeah, voice is low. Yeah, so yeah, your voice it's, it's, is almost like this back then. I know. If I if I tried to sing that now, it'd have to be like a whole octave lower. It's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, um, uh, just just uh, cutting yeah. in there. H- have we just found our uh, end of episode uh, song? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, Little Country Home, like, the wizard difficult one to write because it was like um and and was like well we could you know it was the wizard of oz but it was the wonderful wizard of oz because you couldn't use the film because it's copyrighted but you could use the book Mm. because that's public domain now and so we couldn't use um somewhere over the rainbow which you know was kind of a bit bit weird because that's a song that is completely synonymous with with the wizard of oz but so i had to write a song that served the same function as somewhere over mm. the rainbow, but wasn't. Um, and I don't think it was too bad as a song, um, but yeah, it was like difficult, and it was an important thing for me as a kind of someone writing songs for shows to learn because I'd I'd written a song that was quite difficult to sing, and mm. that was you know, something that I have to take into consideration in future things, because, um, yeah. Well, uh, you were saying about song, about uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, we've had um, Follow the Yellow Brick Road, we couldn't do that one either, like you say, for copyright reasons, so you've written um, oh, Along yeah. the Road of Yellow Bricks, yeah. or whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah. that was yeah. fun. It was called, it was called Hello Yellow Brick Road, um, as a kind of yeah. joke on the Alan John. Or is that going to be our ending well, music? I think that Wait till the ending. end and find out for yourselves. I think that should be the, the ending music because the harmonies are brilliant in it. <laughs> I, d- I mean, th- that was that was a weird one because Anne, well, I, think I, st- I think I wrote a song and then Anne said, oh, I want it to be like a canon um, where the each person, you know, the, it, people can start at different points in the verse and sing and it all works together, you know, and... Um, so I had to f- like sit down and write that quite theoretically and figure out how it works. And I wasn't particularly happy with it. Um, <laughs> and ironically, in the end, we didn't actually sing it as a canon because Anne decided she didn't like it. So, <laughs> 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 so we were stuck with this melody that was a bit a bit clunky. Um, but yeah, anyway, never mind. It wasn't my finest hour as a <laughs> show in terms of the score. But but hey. It was- it was his darkest it was hour. <laughs> I mean, nothing could compare to Mind the Poo. <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to be the last song? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, so we did, what did we do after that? We did The Ugly Duckling. Yes. I don't know if you remember it. So this is the kind of running thing that whenever we talk about this show, we can never really remember much about it. Um, <laughs> do you? What do you remember from that show? Um, I remember that I played a 
very feisty and very bolshy uh, character called Greta Greengrass. And I also played the swan at the end of the show, oh, yes. uh, which consisted of me putting on a ridiculously large costume, which uh, the costume change was long and drawn out and almost made me miss my cue several times. Um, but yeah, it was a very fun show. And yeah, I think we all had a lot of fun doing it. So yeah. Yeah, and you had songs in that one as well. There was that song uh, that you. There was that duet you sang with Jacob, which wasn't very good. Uh, the song, <laughs> not your performance. The, the <laughs> My performance <laughs> as well. It's fine. Just um, like it's fine. Don't worry. I thought you. I um, thought you were dissing her performance at yeah. first. <laughs> you invite no, no, me no, on this sorry, podcast. No. You diss my performance. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm slugging off my own songs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just be grateful you're in Sheffield, James, and not round here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, I th- I th- by and large, the songs for that one were a lot better, I think. Um, and, of course, there was um, Get to Regretta slash No Fox Given, which was... <laughs> <laughs> because why not? Yeah. So and then you you left Anvil for a while, um, but then you joined us in hereafter for uh, Aladdin. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So I had a couple of small roles in that, which were great. Really enjoyed, um, and it was great to be back with you all again. I had missed you. Um, so yeah, that was really fun, and hopefully we'll be back next year. I really hope. All this year. This year would be great, but hopefully next year as well. <laughs> well hopefully all the years to come. Yes. Hopefully. <laughs> well, you've got a bigger role, a you know, fairly fairly big role in Dick Whittington, um, which we're hoping to do this Christmas. Um so we we'll look forward to to doing that, hopefully. Yes. Hopefully. All being well. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. All going well. And have you played a, a male character before? I haven't, no, so this will be interesting. No. <laughs> hang on, hang on, yes, you have. Oh, yeah. No, the guard. Was the guard male? I don't even know. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was he called was um, Shin Guard. Oh, oh I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, he was male. <laughs> yeah, male. <laughs> the costume was male as well. Oh, whatever, yeah. okay. Yeah. The, um, but speaking of roles you played, <laughs> have you played any roles in any Shakespearean plays that we've done with Anvil? I'm gonna have to think about what they were. Tempest, wasn't it? I can't even remember what they were. I believe it was the Tempest, Um, yes. Yes, it was. Um, I had a few small roles in that. Uh, I was only 14 at the time, so I didn't really have a great understanding of Shakespeare, and I'll be honest, uh, it was very new to me. So um, I was quite daunted at the time. seeing people get so involved in it and I just felt quite out of my quite out of my depth really um but yeah I I really would look forward to having like a, a bigger role in, Sh- in a Shakespeare production in the future um but yeah I did really enjoy that and it was nice to just um perform it at different venues as well we went down mm. to Aberystwyth yes, nice. in in Mid Wales and yeah. that was really good I really enjoyed that we've asked Jacob the same question like um last time of what would role would you have where uh, so again, what role would you like to be in a Shakespeare play? Any Shakespeare play? Ooh. Um, if you were if you were able to just say I'm having that role, mm-hmm. I think I'd say Viola. Um, From which play? Twelfth, Twelfth Night. Night yeah. yeah, I think I'd say Viola from Twelfth Night because she's quite a bold and. Um, brassy character well from how i saw her portrayed in the national theater production a few years ago um so yeah um i think she'd be a fun one to play and i'd quite like to do that one day fair enough yeah i can imagine that and can i ask then uh seeing as we're on this topic what uh if you guys have um shakespeare characters that you'd like to play um well i would love to play macbeth in the in the namesake play Macbeth, yeah, <laughs> because we we all know I'm able to do the uh, the monolo- the famous monologue. <laughs> oh yeah, 
and I'm able to correct a certain actor. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You mentioned that. Okay, it comes up in every episode. Time. Let's. let's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 that actor must be your favorite actor because you keep mentioning. <laughs> uh, anyone else? <clears throat> um, I mean, I I played the role of bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream, and that was a lot of fun. Um, you want to do that again? Yes, I would like to play the role of bottom again, actually. But uh, this time without having to be another character as well. Just just solely just, as Nick Bottom. Just focusing on the one character. Yeah. yeah. Also, uh, also as uh, in Twelfth Night as well, um, um, was, is it Malvolio he's called? Yeah. yeah yes. that, one, that one as well. Yeah, and I can imagine he was a festa as well in, oh, in Twelfth you. Night, actually. Um, Wait, hang on. The singing jester. Have you heard my singing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be hilarious. <laughs> That's the point, the jester. <laughs> Rob? Uh, well, for me, because I think I'm the only one here who um, hasn't uh, done a, Shakespeare, a, a Shakespearean play yet. Um, mm. I, I don't have... Uh, as of yet, I don't have a particular character that I'd particularly like to play. Um, I'd be happy to sort of accept any role. Um, I'd prefer it to be like a small role to begin with because I don't know how I'd, um, if if I'd find learning the, the language and the lines easy or if I need like a bit more time to learn it, I don't know. So I, I'd prefer to have a small role to start off with. Um, but you know, I'm always up for a challenge. So, um, that sort of brings me into the question I want to ask, uh, Saren, when you got your first Shakespearean role, um, did you find, uh, learning the lines and learning the language difficult or, uh, did it come easy to you? And what was, if you had, what was your technique to, to learn it? Well, I was lucky because of my age. Um, our director, Anne, uh, knew that I probably wouldn't be able to take on a large role. So mm. the dialogue that I had was pretty short and there wasn't much um, I had to learn, really. Um, I adapted to it quite quickly, as I said, because it was it, I didn't really have much of a role, which suited me fine at the time. Um, but yes, the language is, obviously, it's archaic English, so it's completely different to modern day English. Um, yeah. Yeah, I did find that a bit of a challenge at first, but I think once you get, once you do one, once you've done one, one role, um, and once mm. you've actually looked at one play, um, it just, you just kind of pick it up from there and then you'll get used to like the iambic pentameter and just, um, you'll learn to like focus in more on the meaning as you're acting. Um, it just kind of flows. You'll find that it does in a strange way. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you s suggest to try to, um, uh, well, I, I think it's important with any kind of lines that you're trying to learn, but would you suggest with Shakespearean lines to uh, try to learn what they mean first? And yes. And learn the that, words? Yeah. yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. that does help. Um, mm -hmm. And especially with some scripts, you do usually have like a vocabulary list at the side, um, mm. which does help. And obviously you can ask actors other questions and you can do your own research. I think that really helps mm. if you research around the character in mm -hmm. particular, um, especially like watching clips from older productions. I remember um, from my characters, even though they're only small, I still watch clips from older productions and that really helped me to see how they were portrayed on stage. Mm. So yeah, I would recommend that strongly. Because mm -hmm. also sometimes you see Shakespearean actors if they if they have to deliver a line where they're like making reference to something that's like I don't know it might just be like an object or something or something that we would recognise but the language that Shakespeare uses is like archaic they'll quite often do a kind of mime or a gesture to kind of uh, symbolise to, to to convey to the audience what they mean so mm -hmm. they might be talking about. I don't know, pouring water into a bucket or something, but instead of saying bucket, they say some archaic equivalent, but they, they mime it out so you can... Um, but what watching other productions helps you like helps you with that, I'd say. Yes, definitely. Is there any 
plays other than Shakespeare that you would like to do in the future at some point? Hmm. Um, do you know what? I would honestly be up for anything. Um, <laughs> and I, I mean that wholeheartedly. Honestly, I would be up for anything. Um, I'm a pretty open book and I'll give anything a try. Um, Fair enough. I just want new yeah. experiences in theatre and yeah, I honestly be up for anything. So mm -hmm. anything that comes my way, if it looks interesting, mm -hmm. I'll go for it. <laughs> All you're asking for is the experience then. Yeah. Basically, any for any budding actor, I'd basically just suggest it's just go for anything that comes your way because it's it's hard to basically go and look for things yourself and anything that just comes to you and lands on your lap, just take it really. If you're looking for experience, just take whatever lands on your lap really. Um because it, it mm. as you know, it, it is hard to just go out there and look um because things are always come to you at the right time so yeah mm, yeah and you you make connections and you meet other people exactly and, yeah, yeah building connections to bigger things yeah. oh yeah yeah i think i think that's important uh despite uh what um at what point in your career you're at um whether you're established ish or uh just starting out um i think that's still important to uh to do um except uh, accept all like even small roles accept them because um if you're making and, and building up those contacts like eventually you'll land that big role that will hopefully get you recognized and get you more bigger roles um as you pro as you progress on so yeah i think that's important um Okay, another question I have is, what types of acting do you feel you are most suited to? And which do you feel you uh, need more experience in? Hmm. That's good. Yeah. Asking the hard questions here, guys. Yeah, you are. <laughs> you are. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, think I, I think I'm the only one really with like a list of possible <laughs> questions. <laughs> yeah, you'll miss the preparation this week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean basically any character that's just the opposite to who i am um so if you, if you know me really well then um <laughs> um you'll know that i'm not a, a typical female let's just say um so uh <laughs> anything that anything that's just opposite to who i am really as a person um i think that as an actor that would challenge me more because sticking in your comfort zone isn't always the best thing to do, especially when you're looking to evolve as an actor. So, um, yeah, I think anything that's the opposite to who I am as a person is something that I would challenge myself to do in the future, to take roles in that sort of, uh, that sort of skill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've heard of some directors that kind of use that idea of a way of getting a good performance. For example, mm. um, if you wanted a gay character, they'll get a straight guy to play a gay character and a gay man to play a uh, wait, hang on. Yeah, a gay man to play a straight character and a straight character to play a gay man. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, you guys what I mean. I do. I, <laughs> yeah, I think. But they, they'd use that as the um, uh, as a way of getting a good performance as well. I've heard. Of, I don't. I forgot who does that. I, and well, I don't. Did, that was. Uh, the, Talking of two straight actors playing gay, Brokeback Mountain is a, a, a film often praised for the two straight actors playing mm. gay characters. Well, it's actually it's a it's an ongoing debate at the moment because um, Russell T Davis recently said that because uh, he he's just had this program called It's a Sin, uh, which mm. is about the 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 AIDS. Um, oh yeah, the AIDS whatever the phrase would be epidemic crisis. I don't know. Anyway, the and and he said that uh, he doesn't think that straight actors should play gay roles. Um, and it got quite a lot of backlash. But it, but it's a debate that's mm. happening at the moment in broader yeah. terms with like, uh, for instance, I don't know, disabled non-disabled people playing disabled characters mm. or well, <laughs> non-transgender people playing transgender characters and so on and so forth. As a you know. As a disabled LGBT person, I can say that I'm perfectly happy for anyone who is not disabled or gay to play an opposite character. Mm, yeah. I feel the yeah. same way. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. as an LGBT yeah. person myself as well. Um, I just I just see it from an actor's perspective because to grow as an actor, you need to challenge yourself to play someone who is not like yourself. Exactly. Um, so 
from that perspective, yes, I agree. Um, I have, as I, as I agree with you, James, I have seen a lot in the media at the moment mm. uh, relating to this subject. And um, yeah, it's difficult to form an opinion in a way because there's two perspectives. So you can look at it from the perspective of people who are not looking at the, the actor's side and, you know, and thinking, well, these people might want to challenge themselves as actors. Um, so yeah, there's two sides of looking at it, I suppose. I, th I think it, I mean, I understand where the argument comes from, but I, I also think that, I, d I don't know, I think, as I said earlier, like the appeal of acting for so many people is the, the fact that it allows you an opportunity to pretend to be someone that you're not. And I think that can, that, that there's, there's something kind of beautiful about that. And I think it'd be a real shame if acting becomes a profession in which you are hired to speak lines as yourself mm. almost. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, role, the role of whatever character you're playing should go to whoever's, uh, best place to play the character, you know, through yeah. auditions and what have you. Yeah. If they find that somebody, that one particular person is best place to play that particular character, yeah. even if it's yeah. a, a straight person playing a gay person, then yeah. they should be given the opportunity to play it. Yeah. As long as everything's fair, you're... Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. And funny enough, actually, in, in the theatre world, I think we're seeing a lot... We're kind of seeing almost the opposite of that with this the trend for kind of um, blind casting, as I think it's called, which is... You know, in a lot of uh, sort of classical theatre now, you see uh, actors of you know of all different kind of kinds playing people of different genders or ethnicities or whatever. And it's yeah, it's interesting. There's this kind of almost this split going on between these two yeah two things that are, are both kind of inform. They're they're both trying to be progressive, but they're kind of going in opposite directions. It's kind of yeah, well, talking of Harry Potter, the stage production of uh, is it the Cursed Child? Yeah, they had a a black actress playing Hermione. And yes, the the, films. the author of the book though was saying, in nowhere, nowhere in any of my books have I stated the ethnicity of Hermione. In I think uh, the second book, the Chamber of Secrets, Hermione's white face was quoted. Oh, was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, there we go. Have you seen that? Um, have you seen that Gus Johnson sketch about J.K. Rowling? Oh yeah, that was just hilarious. Noticed. I've not seen that one. <laughs> How dare you say the oh, author's name as well? You, <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving on slightly. Um, another question that I have is that um, I assume everyone here um, has, uh, well, of course, we've all had feedback on our characters that we played or the shows that we've been in, um, whether that's uh, positive or negative feedback. Um, so my question is, uh, Saren, how do you, how do you, how do you react when you receive negative feedback? Well, the most of the negative feedback I received was mainly when I was younger. Um, I was starting out, so between the ages of 13, 14. So I was quite naive, and I'll be honest, back then it really used to hurt. It did. <laughs> um, but yeah, now I'm able to take it on the chin, and I'm, I'm learning from it a lot more. But when you're at that age, you're so impressionable, and everything you, you take everything personal. But now... I'm seeing it more, feed, a negative feedback more as something that's helping me grow, especially as an actor. Um, because, you know, we've all got something to learn. You know, we're never, we're constantly learning. You know, you can, there's never like an actor who can say, I know everything. I know everything about my character. I know everything about being an actor because we don't. <laughs> we, we're learning all the time. And yeah, every true. show we do, uh, there's something different to learn. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it is, you know, in retrospect, you you were so, you were like really young doing, yeah. like for instance, Robin Hood, you know, you're 13 doing a show with adults, really. I think, yeah, I, and Gary was like 16, but like everyone was like, you know, an adult and, and you know, was being directed by an adult and members of the cast were, you know, m like significantly older than you. So it must have been 
quite daunting in retrospect, you know? Yeah, I'll admit it was at the time. Um, but yeah, be, being that age and going into something, um, leveling up and working with adults was very new. <laughs> um, but obviously now I've adapted to that and I'm a lot older <laughs> and I'm on, I'm probably on the same intellectual level now. So you don't take the criticism as harshly as you do when you're younger. Um, and yeah, you learn from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, um, just to kind of bring us up to date, uh, you've recently done, uh, some audio drama stuff with us as well. Um, yes. So you've done, let me see, you did Matter of Husbands. Yes. Uh, with Ang Harrods. That was the first one. And you're in Cinderella and Enemy of the People. Yes. Yeah. How have you found that experience of, of doing well, uh, audio? it's the first time I've been involved in audio dramas before. Um, I have to say completely different to acting on stage. Um, and it's taught me to adapt my voice more as well, because obviously when you're on stage, you're taught voice projection and, you know, and using the acoustics and things of the theatre. But um, yeah, it's been completely different, obviously, because you're not expressing yourself, that your body language is, it goes out the window. And um, yeah, that's for me, just learning to use my voice more and playing around with my voice and just, um, yeah, just expressing myself more without just forgetting like the physical side of acting um, has been completely new, <laughs> um, but I've really enjoyed it. Um, and making Cinderella was really fun, you know, uh, I think we had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Um, doing a panto online for the first time that was completely new but it, very enjoyable as well and when you first um get approached to play uh, uh, any role um do you have any techniques that you use to um make that character believable well for me i'd probably say doing a lot of research around the character um mm. and um, again, watching loads of videos from past productions and seeing how other actors have taken on the role um, has really helped me as well. Not really because I'm trying to like, imitate other actors, but um, picking up certain mannerisms and just getting used to the character themselves. And I find once you start to get involved more um, on a personal level with the character, so um, through, you know, watching and watching clips and researching um that's when you start to step into that character a lot more so that's something that i like to use um to create a good first impression really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cool um and you just uh briefly mentioned um uh, that you're not trying to uh emulate either either actors um but do you have uh a, a, an an actor, uh, whether that's a professional actor or or uh, a lesser known actor, that you want to try to emulate, or do you want to try to put your own your own stamp on things? No, I'm not really someone that is is no. I I I tend to want to just stick to my own how I present myself, and I don't really try to like embody any other characteristics or um yeah any other characteristics from any other people um mm -hmm. i'm very much for being my own person and um i think you can also pe people can get you confused with other people if you just try to copy others um so mm -hmm. um <laughs> um yeah I i'm very much for being my own person and plus everyone's got something new to offer so yeah why try and copy why try and emulate other people when you've just got something to offer that no one else can really yeah yeah i, I think every every individual it i think every individual person is unique in their own way so exactly uh yeah uh i agree with your point yeah Okay, and now it's time for this week's quiz, which uh, Robert is doing. So I'll let Robert explain the premise of this week's quiz. So this quiz is, I'm going to give you um, some anagrams from uh, the subject is Shakespeare. So they're going to be anagrams of, of characters from 
uh, different sh- uh, Shakespeare plays. Um, so it's your job to unscramble that anagram and come up with the answer. Um, I will give you I will give you a hint and how many how many words um, there is. So and there's going to be ten of them. So I will uh, award one point for the correct answer and another point for the correct spelling. Um, and for uh, the the viewers watching on YouTube, there will be uh, the words and the hints and etc. will come up on the screen. Number one is O oh, to Hell. And the hint is who is the jealous protagonist? And there is one word. Right, so number two is men so dead. Uh, the hint is name the female lead from the classic tragedy of betrayal and murder set in Venice. It is one word. So number three uh, is blame thy cad. Hopefully I've said that right. Um, and the hint is she's the wife of the power mad Scott who kills to become kin. Her name. It is two words and it includes the title. Okay, question four is plot a race. And the hint is who is the beguiling foreign queen? One word. Number five is hot, cute son. And the hint is who is the court jester from as you like it? It is one word. I've seen that play twice and I can't remember because it's so bad. <laughs> I've, I've never watched it for that reason. So I've heard so many bad watched, things about it. I've watched it like four times and I still can't remember anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> but number six is Morg 2, Amen. Uh, it's, uh, the hint is one of Shakespeare's most famous lovers. It is two words, first and last name. Uh, number seven is a human pest. <laughs> and the hint is... James. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number seven, a human pest. And the hint is fill in the character from a later, less frequently performed Shakespearean tragedy. He's described as a churlish commentator, most opposite to humanity. It is one word. Oh. Mm. Oh. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, uh, no. oh dear. Um. Steve is having some aggressive <laughs> thinking noises right now. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think what the word was. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Blink that one out. <laughs> I think I know, but I can't think what the. Oh. Number eight is what a holy mess. And the hint is name the tragic religious figure, first and last name, who defied a powerful kin in one of Shakespeare's plays. It it is two words. Uh, Okay, so number nine is O kin affront her area. Thank you, (laughs) Pat. (laughs) <laughs> Number nine, Okin, a frontier area. Who is another tragic figure from Henry VIII? That is the hint. And it is three words. Place includes a three double R. Three words? Yeah, three words and the place includes a double R. So number 10 and the final question is, Cunning Z-rated losers end rant. And the hint is, do you recognize this famous Shakespearean duo who also rated their own play more than 300 years later? And it is three words. Um, So, okay. So now here is the answers. Um, So number one was O to Hell, which is Othello. Number two, Men So Dead. The answer was 
Desdemona. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Number three, blame thy cat, was Lady Macbeth. Hey. Number four, plot a race, was Cleopatra. Number five, was hot cute sun, which was uh, which the answer is touchstone. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so number six was Morg to a man. Uh, the answer is Romeo, uh, however you say it. <laughs> Montague. 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 There we go. So Romeo Montague was number six. Number seven was a human pest. And the answer is ape manthus. Hopefully, again, what? I've said that right. Was that the... Yeah, what, I don't even know what play that's from. <laughs> Never heard of it before. Never heard of that character. It's, it says place. here, Timon of Athens is one of the least frequently produced of Shakespeare plays. Ah, uh, so, right. Okay. Yeah, so it's not very oh, I have, widely heard of. I have seen that one. Yeah. Apomanthus, I think it is, I guess. Yeah, okay. <laughs> how do, how do you say it? Ap- Apomanthus, I think. Okay, well... The answer is either ape monthus or apple monthus. So the spell, uh, the word will be on the screen anyway. So yeah, that is the answer. <laughs> Number eight was what a holy mess. And uh, the f- can you tell me the first name at least, Damien? Oh, they got us Hamlet. <laughs> the name you were actually looking for is Thomas Wolseley. <laughs> I got W O. Oh. O-Y-S-S left. And I can't make anything out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Wol- Wolsey. Wolsey, yeah. That's it. Uh, so number nine was Okin affronts her area, which the answer is uh, Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon. Yeah. That oh, is, oh that is right. Although... Although, as it said in the clue, Aragon is misspelled. Yeah. I um, guess they couldn't quite make the letters fit or whatever, but yeah. Number 10 was Cunning Z rated losers end rant. And the answer is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Oh Yay. my gosh. I studied that play this year as well. Why didn't I not? Oh. <laughs> That makes me feel really stupid now because I, I just got it with the Z. I was thinking, which Shakespeare play has a Z in it? <laughs> why did I not think of that? I've literally. Ugh, why did I not think of that? So that was uh, ten anagrams of uh, Shakespearean characters from various plays. Um, one point will be awarded for the correct answer, and um, another point will be uh, awarded for the correct spelling. Six. Is that with the correct spelling as well? With the correct spelling as well. Okay. Six. <laughs> oh, six okay. Six out of 20. Okay. Can, I, can anyone beat six out, out of 20? <laughs> uh, I just want to check the spelling or something because I don't know if I spelled it correctly. Okay. Uh, I got 14. 14 out of 20. Okay. Damien Looks like James is today's big loser now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so far, James is in first place. Damien in second place. Saren, can you go any higher? No, I got 10. I'm afraid I've only got 10. I got 10 as well. Oh, Oh, we know what that means, don't we? (laughs) No, Damien. (laughs) No, it's something different. Oh, okay. Right, okay. Are you going to say it, Steve? Well, uh, Damien is this week's big loser. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I was waiting for. Oh. (laughs) That's what I was waiting for. I was thinking... I was thinking of Panto stuff in my head, so... Nope. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because he's the loser, he gets to choose the questions next time. Yay. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you for that quiz, Rob. Yeah. That was, uh, that was You're welcome. Was. Hope, you, hope you enjoyed yeah, it and great. found it different. Um, yeah. I hope the viewers uh, enjoyed that as well. Uh, comment down below telling us uh, what, what is your scores. Can you beat... Uh, what was it, James? 16 out of 10? Uh, 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14. 14.
<laughs> 14 out of 10. Yeah, 14, yeah. That makes sense. Yes. Um, maths. Yes. I don't, I don't do that. Um, so can anyone beat 14 out of 20? Comment down below. Bing bong. Okay. And, um, well, that sound, um, as you know, signals the end to the episode. Um, thank you, Saren, for being our guest. Um, hope you've uh, enjoyed uh, being here. And, uh, yeah, thank hopefully, you for having me. You're welcome. Uh, hopefully, thank you. Uh, <laughs> hopefully you'd like to come on again at a future date. Um, but uh, yeah, if you guys, the viewers, have uh, enjoyed this episode also, then you know what to do. Uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and comment down below uh, telling us what you think, feedback, positive or negative, uh, it's all welcome. And if you are watching on any other platform, then please hit that follow button. This podcast is now available on most streaming platforms. Why not check us out on the Hereafter Productions Bandcamp? And don't forget to check out the links in the descriptions for our other channels and websites. And on that note, it's uh, bye from our special guest, Saren. Bye. And it's bye from me. Bye-bye. It, it's a toodle pip from me. And it's a uh, bye, goodbye, and a toodle pip from, from me, because, yeah, why not? <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and to play us out, here's that song that we mentioned earlier from the Wizard of... Oh, sorry, from the wonderful Wizard of Oz... Um, the one that was written to replace uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. It's called Little Country Home, and it's a firm handshake and a stoic farewell from me. <laughs> <laughs> stoic. Uh, I said that wrong. And it's a firm handshake and a stoic farewell from me. Until the next time. Cheerio! Bye-bye! -bye. <laughs> Ta-ta, lovelies. <laughs> <laughs> By my darlings.
assume or change I'll find the wings I need to fly 